Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're talking about whether or not mulch takes nitrogen from the soil. This is a hotly debated topic in the world of YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and actually on one of my videos that I posted not too long ago about the deep mulch method, where a gentleman was so very kind to basically call me an idiot. So this is a, I guess, a response or a way of looking at nitrogen and mulch and sequestration in the soil, all that fun stuff from a science perspective. So while I can respect and understand that there are YouTubers out there making lots of content on soil and soil science, doesn't mean they took four years of schooling for it, but they're free to do that. I'm sorry if my narrative doesn't fit their narrative, but my narrative's out of textbooks. So blame it on the education system, I guess. The um, gentleman basically said that with the deep mulch method, that because it's not incorporated into the soil, that it isn't going to cause nitrogen to be held up in the profile. Now, while I can respect that and the fact that the deep mulch method or mulching methods in general, there are different versions of it. And in different versions, you remove that mulch every single year and you compost it or you throw it out, whatever the case is, which is fine. And in that case, no, you're not going to end up with nitrogen being sucked up out of the soil system to help degrade the mulch. Now, with that being said, if you look at the roof stout method, you're actually meant to add that mulch. If you read her original book, which is what I did, you, put the uh, mulch on and then every year you stack up on it. So you're going to actually change that soil profile entirely. You're going to end up with something called the LFH horizon. So that's actually considered the leaf litter horizon. And we don't typically see a leaf litter horizon unless it's in the forest. So because we are changing and gardening is something manipulated by humans, I would argue when we're doing like a deep mulch method or we're adding lots of organic material, we are making our kind of a new soil profile. So classically on farmland, for example, we are dealing with chernozemic soils. So chernozemic soil basically refers to a soil profile that has an organic horizon, an A horizon, a B, a C. Sometimes there's other horizons in the middle that are in special case scenarios, but for the most part, that's what it's going to look like. Depending on the age of the chernozem and the parent material, you're going to have a bigger or a larger organic material layer. That's that real black stuff. And in a forest soil scenario, we have that leaf litter layer. So typically in a forest soil, we have a very thick layer of undigested, for lack of a better term, undecomposed leaf stuff. So it can be uh, dead tree, bark, um, leaves, stems, whatever. And it's, it can be relatively thick depending on the ecosystem that you're working in. So rainforest is going to be a little bit thinner and something like the boreal forest where it's a bit cooler, that layer may be a bit thicker. A jack pine stand versus an aspen leaf stand all are going to have slight differences. And when we look at a garden soil, especially some of the ones that we're designing now, we have a hybrid of a chernozemic soil with this forest soil. Because forest soils typically are very sandy soils, they have a very small organic horizon, a very small A horizon. It's mostly sand, alluviated sand at that. And we have, we're using soil that is from a chernozemic scenario. So topsoil that we bring in for our flower beds, peat moss, it's, it's more so a chernozem. So we're taking a chernozem and we're plopping that leaf litter layer on top. So we're making kind of like a hybrid. We're making an aspen bluff almost. For Like when you look at it, it's more of like an aspen bluff. So we're drastically changing the dynamics of how that soil works. So we know in a forest soil, for example, that that leaf litter layer 
can alter how nutrients is delivered to the plants. It's also the reason why when we look at a forest, we don't see a ton of weeds and it hugely has to do with that leaf litter layer and it's able its ability to capture nitrogen and microbe activity and all that fun stuff when we look at a tritosemic soil it's drastically different we don't have that leaf litter layer and therefore we have readily available nutrients that's never really tied up in decomposition because we're dealing with grasses we're not dealing with leaf falling <laughs> for lack of a better term so because we mate the two together when we mulch, if we leave that mulch in place and we stack it up over time, which is what the original root stout method is meant to be, because it's meant to be for elderly and lame humans, so, or people who have mobility issues, or people who are elderly, or people such as myself who are lazy. We're, I'm lazy. So what you're doing there is you aren't going to remove that that leaf litter layer, you're gonna leave it in place because that's what the easier method is. But that means it's acting more like a forest soil and less like a turnism. If that makes, I don't know if that makes any sense, you guys. So mulch has a ton of nutrients in it. It has a high micronutrient profile, a high macronutrient profile, but it's very low in available nitrogen. And this is to be suspected. However, microbes need nitrogen as fuel. So in order to decompose that newly added organic material, microbes come in and they borrow nitrogen from the soil and they use it to fuel the fire to degrade the mulch. Now, when this happens, the nitrogen doesn't simply disappear. It's actually sequestrated into the soil food web and as it's in that system, it's just being held on to temporarily before it will soon be released back into the soil once those microbes die and finish their duty. Something to keep in mind is this happens when you add any organic material. The difference is, is that when you add a compost or a manure, because it's so highly degraded already, we don't need as much microbe activity or it's not um, it's not as much of a microbe magnet that we see these effects. With mulch, when we add it to the soil surface, what ultimately ends up happening is because those microbes are trying to decompose that wood or that straw, they need the nitrogen from that soil profile to help fuel their fire. Once the microbes pass away because they've decomposed that mulch enough, they will release that nitrogen back into the soil in a bioavailable format. This can, in some soil systems, especially in something that's a sandy soil or a heavily cropped soil, so something that has tomatoes um, continuously cropped on it for an entire year, maybe you're doing two uh, crop rotations a year if it's possible in your area, those soils over time may become depleted from nitrogen, especially if we are throwing in mulch. This is amplified if we actually rototill it into the soil profile. So if we mix that wood chip or that straw into the soil profile, it's amplified because now we aren't just occupying the microbes in the first you know, inch or two of the soil. We are now calling to attention all the microbes throughout the entire profile that we've decided to rototill it into the system with. So that is something to keep in mind. If you mix it into the soil, you're going to have more nitrogen lockdown in the soil system rather than less of it being available to the plants. But this is what makes mulch so superior to any sort of weed control on the planet. Because it's able to deplete the nitrogen concentration in that top layer, any seedlings that do pop up or germinate in that first two inch layer of soil quickly are depleted of nitrogen and therefore they don't survive. That's why it's such a good weed barrier and it's so efficient. People like to think that it's because it blocks out the sun and yada, 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 that ultimately it has a lot to do with that nutrient not being grabbable for them in that immediate moment. Now, 
if over time you stack mulch layers up on top of each other and you don't rototill it in, say you're doing a no dig or a low till, no till system, and you're stacking those mulch layers up on top of each other, you're going to develop a leaf litter layer. Now, as you your leaf litter layer degrades more and more, you ultimately will eventually be planting into mulch. However, because by the time that happens, it's going to be many, many years down the road, there's very little likelihood that you're going to have any nitrogen sequestrated in the decomposition of that product because by that point, it is degraded enough that the microbes are it's not as intensive as a system anymore. So you don't have to worry about it. It is only when you rototill in fresh mulch that's a year old, the stuff that's still nice and moist, like freshly wood chipped mulch, and you dig that into the soil, that's when it's cause for concern. Start having to think about supplementing nitrogen. And by all means, if you have a heavy clay soil, if you have a soil that's completely unmanageable and you're trying to work in some sort of aggregation into the system, then by all means use mulch. Just be aware that you should be supplementing um, a bit heavier than you normally would with a fertilizer. There's ways around this. It's not an end all be all when it comes to mulching. The other method that you could do if you choose to use mulch in the garden is to mulch the a crop and then remove it at the end of the year and then actually compost it. If you compost it for an entire year after you've used it in the garden for a year, it's not going to cause any issues whatsoever. But in the initial stages, it will reserve nitrogen. The nitrogen is not disappearing. It's not sailing off into the sunset. It's just being utilized elsewhere. So think of it as um, if any millennials will be able to get on board with this but anyone who's had anxiety or an anxiety issue um personally for me when i have an anxious episode i find that my extremities and my face and my feet tend to go numb so i like to think of mulch in that sense so the lower profile, the top profile, is going to be my hands and my face. So there's not a lot of blood flow. Stuff is disappearing from my extremities. It's getting a bit, a bit numb. It's not functioning the way it's supposed to. But everything in the core center is still functioning properly and therefore I'm alive and well. It's not like my pinkies are gonna plop off or anything like that. So while it is a slight handicap to the soil, it's not overly detrimental to it. I hope you guys found this helpful. I hope it dispelled some of the myths behind nitrogen and mulch. So I can assure you that this myth is not busted. It's very real. Mulch does steal nitrogen so long as it is under a year and it is fresh mulch. The older the mulch is, the less likely it is to steal nitrogen. And so long as it isn't incorporated into the soil, it is unlikely to heavily affect your plants because your plant roots are so far below that two inches that is effective. However, because that mulch does take the nitrogen out of the soil profile in that first two inches, that's what makes it so awesome at controlling weeds. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, let me know in the comments down below what you use for mulch and if you use it all over the garden or just for specific crops or flowers. Personally, I like the look of mulch. I do. I don't, um, I like straw. I'm starting to become more in love with the idea of straw. However, something to note, straw bales can have pesticides in them so just like double check who you're getting them from be kind of careful in that sense but i personally like wood chips or a compost that is not fully degraded and you guys will know what i'm talking about if you ever saw it it's like kind it's half wood chip half compost i don't know how to explain it but that stuff honestly i wouldn't incorporate it into the soil but i do top dress with and have top dressed with in the past this year i'm doing mulch and I'm planning to do cover crops. So I'm doing two different styles of organic type farming stuff. Um, so we'll see which one has better results. 
personally, I'm more excited for the cover crop method just because I feel like insects and um, birds, just my backyard in general, will thrive and be a little bit happier based on a cover crop just because it's more flowers, it's more vegetation, higher utilization of water, that sort of thing. So we'll see which one ends up resulting in better. However, if you're looking to conserve water, I highly recommend giving it a shot. It works really, really well. Um, and if you're sick of weeding, also, if you are sick of weeding, be sure to check out cover crops or um, cover crops or mulching. It, revolutionary the results so i will talk to you guys next time bye